Well, thank you for joining us. Uh, I think we're going to be making these a uh, uh, regular routine on, um, on Thursdays. It seems like it's a, a, a good night to do this. And I'd uh, really like your uh, comments on what other topics we can talk about. I know last time we did uh, survival, survival kits in general, and this weekend we thought knives would be a, a good place to start. Um, I'm not a, a metallurgist. Uh, I do make knives, but not making knives as in a true knife maker. Uh, we uh, uh, put together knives, we get the prefab blades, which most knife makers would say is not a knife maker now. I would tend to agree with them. Um, but uh, this is more about the basics of knives. The, we're going to talk a little bit about the metal, about types of knives. So if you're an expert on knives, you may find this a little bit basic. If you uh, want to learn some of the basics about knives and different types, I think you'll find this interesting. Uh, and definitely uh, uh, write in some of your uh, uh, questions, comments. Uh, if I know the answer, I'll be happy to share it with you. And if I don't, uh, I'll find out the answers and I'll put them in the comments uh, after this segment's over. Uh, knives basically uh, are a tool. Uh, most people will either use them as a tool. Uh, those people will have just a couple knives. They're your outdoorsmen, your hunters. Then you'll get people that'll uh, go a little bit beyond that. Uh, they'll get into knives. They'll have several different types uh, for different uh, purposes. Maybe they'll have some hunting, some for self-defense. Uh, they'll maybe have uh, uh, 10 knives in their collection. Then we go into a totally different group. They'll use it. There'll be the knife collectors. They're the ones that have the different ones. They'll be able to tell you the, the nuances between the different knives. Um, it's a hobby for them. They'll have 50 to 100 knives. And uh, it, it's their collection, it's their hobby, and uh, they're really the, the knife experts on that. Uh, but basically, a knife is a tool. We go back to the primitive times, uh, the cavemen, uh, they would just have a knife out of a uh, rock. This happens to be obsidian. A friend of mine, Eric Callahan, uh, uh, made a couple knives for me as, as gifts. This is a obsidian knife. Uh, and knives were made back in prehistoric times for one purpose, and that was to cut. So obsidian, a rock, it uh, fractures at the molecular level, so nothing can be sharper than this. But the way you use this so it doesn't break is it's only for cutting and it would be a straight cut. So if you did any lateral motion, this blade would crack in an instant. But slicing it, real quick. Um, this would be another one. This would be more practical for skinning animals. And I've skinned deer with this and it was amazingly easy. The flesh just separated uh, from the bone real, real quick with this. Uh, this would be another obsidian knife and you can see how thin it would be and uh, a friend of mine in South America sent me this this he sent with a sheath and again you notice how short the blade is they didn't want a long blade because they would hold it like this and again for slicing so this these are practical tools that's all a knife would be now naturally unless you're going to be a collector or you want to do reenactments that wouldn't be a knife uh, you would be considering but it's what they use the knife for. Uh, what you would probably be more interested in, uh, a knife if, if you're into bushcrafting, uh, something inexpensive you're gonna be using, and the first thing you wanna consider is what material you wanna make, you wanna uh, purchase your knife out of. Now naturally, a rock, obsidian, or flint isn't gonna be your choice. Uh, basically, there's two types of materials you're going to be considering for making your knife out, uh, purchasing your knife. Uh, and these are broad areas. Uh, again, somebody into knives, there's a lot of nuances, uh, uh, combinations of stainless steel and carbon and, and different uh, blends of the two. But the two broad categories are stainless steel and carbon. Uh, both have their pluses and minuses. Everything's a trade-off. Let's first start off with the carbon. If you get your blade made out of carbon, the pluses are it sharpens relatively easy. You can sharpen your knife. Uh, if it's, you're retouching it, it might only take you 30 seconds to a minute to 
to put to re-put an edge on your blade once you once you use it it starts to get dull not totally dull but starts to get dull 30 seconds to a minute um, if you're stranded in a survival situation you can take a rock with a sharp edge on it like a piece of flint or obsidian or church or something and you can hit it if you're familiar with making fire with flint and steel you can't get sparks off of that carbon blade so it's a fire starting tool if, if you have a carbon knife that's another plus. Uh, the downside of a carbon blade is if you neglect it, leave it in the rain, or don't oil it, occasionally it will rust. Now there's nothing really wrong with a rusty blade. Aesthetically it doesn't look as nice, but it will rust. So you do have to have some maintenance involved with it. Um, they do say it doesn't hold its edge quite as long. I haven't really noticed that, but if that is true, if you can resharpen it or put an edge back in 30 seconds, it's really not that big of a deal. Going to stainless steel blades, um, stainless steel doesn't rust for the most part. So if you neglect your blade, you don't have to put oil on it. Uh, if you neglect it, leave it in the rain accidentally, it's not going to rust. Uh, it's harder to sharpen. It might take you three, four, five times as long to sharpen. You might be saying, well, okay, if it takes a minute to sharpen a carbon blade, we're talking four minutes, maybe five minutes to sharpen a stainless blade. That's not that long. Well, if you're sitting there sharpening a knife, four minutes is a long time. Uh, I'm lazy. Uh, I like to have things done quicker. So for me, that's, that's a consideration. Um, if you are stranded in an emergency situation and you need to make a fire, a stainless steel knife won't make a, a fire with, uh, with a piece of flint. So that's a downside. Now, it depends on the situation. If I, I am a scuba diver, so my dive knife is made out of stainless steel because I'm diving in salt water. And a carbon knife doesn't make sense in that situation. So for me personally, in the woods, in, a, in my survival kits, I like carbon knives. But that's up, up to you, whatever makes more sense to you. Amanda wants to know if stainless steel is harder to sharpen. Yes. Yes. It takes longer. Harder to sharpen means it just takes longer. Can you get it sharp, Amanda? You sure can. It will just take you a longer amount of time. They will say it'll keep an edge a little longer. Uh, I did an experiment about three years ago. Uh, my dad had one of those old razors that you can buy the, uh, by carbon blades and you can buy stainless steel blades. So I bought a pack of carbon blades and a pack of stainless steel blades, and I shaved and I kept track with how long each blade shaved my, uh, my beard until it became dull. And I found that whether I used a carbon blade or a stainless blade, I got about 25 shaves out of both until they kind of started pulling on my beard and uh, I needed to change them. So with my blade test, they seem to stay sharp about the same amount of time. So I just prefer to go with uh, uh, a carbon, carbon blade. Now, I should say, if you go to Walmart, Kmart's are, I guess, defunct now, but most stores, you're going to have a hard time finding a carbon blade. Uh, you're going to have to probably go to a knife show, a gun show, um, and find either a custom knife maker or specifically ask, because commercially, all the manufacturers make stainless steel blades. Why, you ask? Because most people out there think stainless steel is better than carbon because stainless steel doesn't rust. So right now, you watching this, no more than probably 95% of the people out there are about knives. It's a perception thing. They think stainless is better. And if somebody buys a knife at Walmart and they neglect it, which most people would, and it rusts in a month, they're going to be upset. They're going to take it back. And the... Uh, uh, manufacturers and the stores don't want to have that hassle. Amanda wants to know the time frame differences to sharpen and carbon. Okay, I'm going to ask you a question, Amanda. How dull did you let the knife get? Uh, the trick to sharpening knives is don't let it get dull. If you, as soon as you're using a knife and it starts to get a li little bit dull, if you take 30 seconds, and we're going to do a segment here on knife sharpening maybe in, in a week or two, if you touch it up and use a sharpener or use a stone a technique, um, about 30 seconds. 
to get it sharp where it'll chafe paper and it's sharp again. If you let it get dirt dull, you're talk probably a carbon blade, you're probably talking maybe two, three minutes to get it sharp. If you get it butter knife dull, you're probably talking about reestablishing that angle and you're probably talking five to eight minutes to get it sharp. Amanda wants to know what 25 shades is masking and tying. Shaving, I shave every morning. That would be almost a month, a little less than a month. Amanda, you could try it shaving your legs. <laughs> uh, get one of those old-fashioned razors and uh, try it yourself. It's a little fun experiment. Okay. Um, the other thing, if you're going to purchase a knife for yourself, and we're going to go through all kinds of knives in a second, uh, we said it's uh, the uh, blade, carbon. Um, the type of blade. Uh, two types of designs. If you see here, this is a straight edge. Straight edge. And this is one of our kitchen knives. Uh, I didn't have a serrated edge. Uh, for a outdoors knife because I don't like them for outdoors knives and I search the house and we don't have one in our house at all But this is one of our kitchen knives and you can see I think most of you know what a serrated edge looks like It's the scalloped edge one So those are your two choices basically when you're looking for an edge. I will tell you this a They, they both have their pluses and minuses a straight edge when it's sharp will cut meat real well, it'll cut rope really well, and it's excellent at carving wood. Everything you want to do with it. A serrated edge will cut rope excellently. It'll cut meat perfectly. Carves wood, lousy. When you're in the woods, I'm going to ask you, what are you going to be doing most of if this is going to be for a bushcraft or survival type knife? You're going to be carving wood. Serrated blades don't carve wood. Also, to sharpen a serrated blade, you need a special stone. This is a pointed one. And what you have to do, I'll get this close to the camera here. You have to take this pointed one and you have to get it in between these serrations, keep the correct angle and sharpen each one of these. Then go to the next one and sharpen that one. And it's tedious to say the least. So my preference is a straight edge if you're purchasing a knife for that reason. Now a good friend of mine is a police officer and he carries on his duty, he has a serrated uh, a blade and he carries it, it's a folding one right here. And what is he doing all day? Well, he's patrolling and he's going to traffic accidents. What's he doing at traffic accidents occasionally? using his knife to cut seat belts to get people out of a, 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 a traffic crash. What would be good? A straight edge would, as long as it's sharp, but honestly, the serrated is going to cut a seat belt just a little bit quicker. So for his application, the serrated makes sense. And I think he's carving wood during the day, so that just makes sense, sense with him. Going back, there is a pretty good rumor about honing, and that uh, honing means you're not putting your knife on a sharpening stone, you put it on a sharpening steel, or deburring it, people call that. And a lot of the old timers will say just what you said, I've never sharpened my knife, but every, I use it for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and I just deburr it. And you might have seen, um, Oh, um, sometimes in the old West movies, they'll take a, a razor they're having and strop it back and forth. The barber does that, taking the burr off. They say if you're using a knife in the woods all day, if every 10, 15 minutes you just strop it to take that burr off, you'll never have to sharpen your knife. And that comment we just, had, uh, we just got kind of confirms that. So that's what I try to do. If I'm using my knife for a week or two when I go out in the woods, I try to just touch it up, and it seems like you never have to sharpen your knife. So I'm glad you made that comment. That's true. Okay, going back to, to the knives again. Um, 
I said two types of, of blades. You have your serrated and you have your straight. Well, someone came up with a, what they thought was a great idea. See this knife here? They decided to put both edges on the same blade. Up front here is your straight, and back here they put the serrated. Seems like a pretty good idea, except if I have a piece of wood here, here's my knife, and I'm in the woods and I want to carve this, how do you carve a piece of wood? Do you take the piece of wood and carve with the tip? Or do you take it and you use the butt end, and when you're carving, carve with the back of the knife? Let's see, like that. If you think about it, you, cut, you carve with the butt end, and that's where they put the serrated part of the, of the blade. So if they would have switched these, that would have been a better idea. So this type of configuration is probably the worst type of configuration. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about, about knives, is um, the knife has to feel good in your hand. That means the handle has to feel good. And there's no way to talk about that. There's no tip or trick I can give you. You actually have to go and hold the knife in your hand. Uh, that's why going to a gun show, once this virus um, uh, gets over and we can gather again, or knife shows, you can go to the different tables, ask the dealer if you can handle the knives, and actually feel it. And the first five or ten tables you go to, you're going to pick up knives, and you'll say, okay, I'm, it feels like a knife. But then you're going to pick up a knife, and you're going to go, oh, that's what Tom was talking about. This one feels really good. Can you talk about folded versus fixed? That's the next thing I'm going to do. So you're going to want to hold the different knives. And I'm going to talk about a, a knife in, in a second called a Mora. And this is one that feels good in most people's hands. So keep that in mind if you want to know what feels good in the hand. Okay, let's talk about folded and fixed blades. Uh, if you're going to get a knife for around the city, you're carrying around the house, around the office, folding knives, fantastic. Uh, I like them to carry around. 98% of them you're going to get, they're stainless steel because they make very few carbon blades, but that's okay, you're using them around the city. Uh, this happens to be a Spyderco. Uh, they make different types, uh, not a whole lot of difference between the, the different ones. Um, I like the ones with a clip. The Spyderco ones, uh, depends, I'm... I'm Kind of a big guy, I'm 6'4". This is called the Endura. It fits good in my pocket. I can sit down, it doesn't dig in my thigh. If you're uh, maybe under six foot, you might want to go, if you want to go with a Spyderco brand. Uh, the Delica, it's a little smaller, probably would fit better in your hand, good knife. Um, great knives, they fold. One downside is there's a joint here. That's the weak spot of the knife. So, around town, great knife. Uh, the joints are very sturdy. I've really never seen one break. However, if you decide to come on one of our survival trips, or on our Maine winter trip where we go up in North Maine woods for two weeks in January, I would not uh, suggest you bring a folding knife because there's a possibility that this joint could break. And on our main trip, we've never had any problem, any situation where people got into a life or death situation, but it's possible. And in that situation, you want to make sure your equipment will not break. So there's a slight, slim possibility that this joint could break. So this is not the knife you want to bring on a trip like that. So in your bug out bag, this is not the knife you want to bring. You can have it as a backup knife, that's not a problem. But if you want a sturdy, solid knife, you want what's called a full hang knife. And that's the one I'm going to show you next. Linda wants to know what you would recommend as an average size blade for a backpack blade. Probably three inch knife. 
three inches smaller. And we can talk about sizes. Everybody wants to go with a big knife, not necessary. Um, I would go, yeah, uh, smaller knife, probably the size of the Mora knife. That's, that's the one I'm going to show you right now as uh, a, a fixed blade knife. This is that Mora knife I was, I was telling you about. Uh, Cheryl, could you run and get a tape measure for me, please, real quick? So I can give exact measurements on this, so I can tell them exactly how, how big this is. This is called a Mora knife. Uh, here's the advertisements, guys. We sell them on our website. They're a very inexpensive knife. They're the best value you ever find. There's other places you can buy this, so I'm not saying you have to buy it from Midwest Native Skills, but it's, uh, it's a great value. Uh, these knives are under $20. Um, we're going to get you a size on them. This handle uh, I, fits in most everyone's hand very well. Um, it's a f the blade almost goes all the way to, to the handle. So this is not a knife I would say you'd want to bring on our North Main Woods trip. But for around here, a backpacker, it would be... A great, uh, great knife. Amanda wants something smaller. I agree. I got one for you, Amanda. Oh, this is a big one. This is four inches. You don't want anything larger than this. Four inch blade. So this Mora knife, fantastic. It comes in stainless steel and it comes in carbon. Um, Nathan agrees with you. He likes the Mora knife. Yeah, they're, they're fantastic. And I think anyone that has one will tell you the same thing. Um, I think these are like $18. Now, I, I mentioned this full tang thing. Okay, I'll tell you, this more here does not have a full tang. I'll tell you exactly what that means. I took the liberty of cutting the handle apart on this one, and I'll show you what a full tang is not. Okay, so here's the handle. You take it apart, and you see the blade goes down, and it stops here. Well, if you start prying on this knife, which you're not supposed to pry with a knife, you can see, if this was in a piece of wood, and I held the back of the handle and started prying, this blade could break out of the handle. So there's two things to prevent that. One, don't pry with the knife, which you're not supposed to do anyway. Uh, second, if you do pry gently, hold the knife fully in your hand like that. But my advice is don't pry with the knife. Um, now, saying that, I know one of my instructors uh, abuses the Mora knife for the past 18 years. He pries, he does everything he should with the knife, and he's not broken it yet. So this is a very tough, durable knife. Uh, I recommend if you're a backpacker around the state parks here, and if you do break a knife, it's not a major concern. Uh, if you're going camping at the campgrounds, state parks, the Mora knife is fantastic. Um, as long as you're not in a true life or death situation. Now, if you are going to be in a true life or death situation, uh, this is a knife that is our school knife. It's called the Anyoek. Uh, this is the one we designed for the school. Um, this blade happens to be... Um, three and a half inches long. I, I went to a knife maker to have this made, and the way we came up with this, uh, L.T. Wright, who uh, worked for Blind Horse Knives, just we sat down for about four hours, and he said, Tom, design, uh, uh, just verbally tell me what you think is the perfect knife that you would want in the woods, and this is what came out of it. You can see here, here's the blade, if I can get this close up to the camera, you can visually see that this blade continues down through the whole knife. That's called a full tang knife. This handle, these are called scales, if you want to know the, the, the correct technical term for it. So the scales are on either side of the blade here, and you can visually see it goes through there. So this is called a full tang knife. So if I would pry with this, which again, you shouldn't do, but you can see I have a whole piece of metal in my hand. Nothing's going to break here. Now, in the case 
of this knife. This is also a full tang knife, but you see this is made of moose antler and a cherry burl here. So you can't really see if this knife goes all the way through. This blade happens to be made from a saw blade from a, a main sawmill. But in the back here, you see that little piece of metal ding there? That's the knife maker telling me, you see, this blade goes all the way through. So this was made by uh, a friend of ours, Dwayne Hansen, up, uh, <laughs> up in Maine. And it says this is a full tang knife. Uh, the real fancy part of this, this happens to be a beaver tail uh, sheath. And back in the trapper days, if I walked into camp, they could care less about the knife. But if I walked in with this uh, beaver tail uh, case, it'd be like me driving into uh, town with a Mercedes-Benz convertible back in the day. But, uh, oh, another folder somebody asked about. This is another very cool, inexpensive knife. This is called an Open L. It's a folding knife. And it's got a barrel on here to lock it in. So it's a very old-fashioned knife. They're extremely sharp. They come in stainless steel. Um, they typically don't have any pocket clips on here anywhere in the world. However, if you buy one from Midwest Native Skills, we exclusively put clips on them so you can get one with a clip if you like these open L knives. And they're, like I said, right around $15, $16. Uh, the clip raises up a little bit, but they're a nice, nice pocket knife too if you like the folders. Do we get another question in? No? Okay, we, uh, somebody said about a, a smaller knife. This is called a Frontier Valley. Real nice sheath. A lot of people like this as a neck knife. They'll put this around their neck, have it here. It's very handy. I like to wear this right on my hip. It's a nice small knife. Uh, everyone over sizes their knives, in my opinion. With this knife, I can carve a bow drill. I can carve a trap. I can skin a deer. I can gut a deer. I can do everything I can with most any other kind of knife. Um, you don't need a big knife. The size of this blade is three inches. If you look, it's full tang. It's, it's a tough, tough, tough little knife. So, fits good in your hand. So if you want a smaller knife, I wouldn't go any smaller than three, maybe two and a half inches. I wouldn't go much smaller than this. Uh, I like this. And when I hold a knife, by the way, you notice I'm always putting my thumb up here. That gives me a little more pressure, a little more control when I'm doing um, very small work. And on this knife, we design, if you notice, if you're buying a knife, if, you, if it's not this one, uh, I like this thumb ramp here. Again, it gives you a little more control. Okay, uh, what else do we have here? Uh, you wouldn't be buying this type of knife, but just uh, this one. If you've never seen this type of knife, this is called a crooked knife. There's only one purpose of this knife, and that's to make bowls. I know a lot of you, if you're into bushcraft, you're thinking, well, how do you make a bowl? Well, in our classes, we actually burn out bowls. We take a piece of wood and put hot coals in there and then burn out an indentation, keep doing that till you get a bowl shape. But another way to do it is you get a crooked knife. And they have these knives just for the purpose, and it's used to carve out an indentation in the bowl. So if you've never seen one, this is a crooked knife, and that's what they exclusively use it for. Um, one other uh, trick that I just wanted to share with you, I'm jumping around a little bit. Uh, I said that carbon knives, they have one downside, that if you neglect them a little bit, they rust. Well, one thing you can do is, I said you can oil them. It doesn't matter what type of oil you put on them. Um, you can use olive oil, cooking oil, uh, baby oil, any kind of oil. 
Uh, what I like using is motor oil, and the best kind is synthetic motor oil. Now, you might be thinking, well, what if you're using it uh, for food and things? Uh, I just wipe it off good. Uh, if you're real concerned about that, then use a, a food-grade oil to oil your knives. Uh, if you're not concerned about that, I just pull the dipstick out of my truck, put a couple drops on my blade, rub it around. Um, that oil really adheres to the metal, doesn't come off. It's great for that. If you want to make your carbon blade rust resistant, if any of you have firearms out there, you can go to Walmart, go to their uh, sporting goods section. There's something, uh, I don't know if you can see this. This is called, there you go, Super Blue. It's a gun bluing. It's used to touch up firearms if they get nicked. All you do is you take steel wool. This happens to be 4 ox steel wool. Okay, let's see if I can get a shot of that. Four zeros, steel wool. Take a piece of the steel wool out. Take your knife. Get all the oil off. Take this gun bluing, take a piece of cotton, put some of this liquid gun bluing on here, wipe the blade down on both sides. It'll dry in about 30 seconds. Take the steel wool again, buff it off, and put a little bit of that oil back on there. The knife blade will turn kind of a gunmetal blue. It'll have a rust resistant coating on it and uh, you're set to go. I do this on all my carbon blades as well as my axes. So you have that. Uh, what else do I have? Uh, Anything uses coconut oil. Coconut oil works good. Any type of oil. Uh, be careful about buying just knives that have been manufactured. I like to go to custom uh, knives. Here's a knife that uh, one of my students traded me. Um, this is one by Bear Grylls. Uh, he has his made by Topps Manufacturing. Uh, his happens to be stainless steel. And the problem with this is sometimes they break. So you have to kind of be careful with what you're getting and if they're manufactured good enough. Uh, you can get fancy ones. Uh, here's one we had made up, and a lot of times this would be for your this wouldn't be for your more or less collectors. Uh, we had this made up. It's our knife blade, but uh, I'm just going to simulate some uh, daylight here. And so we just had this. We had some blue and dark scales put on it. It's a little, little different, but it's our small onyoic. And we did have a big knife, or what we call our big chopper. And this would be anything for the lower 48. If you wanted a big knife, this is what would we'd recommend. It has an anvil here for something called batani. If you're not familiar with batani, you would take this, you would put this on a piece of wood, and you would take another piece of wood and you would hit this anvil we have here and hit it and it would drive it through the piece of wood. So, um, hefty knife. Um, this doesn't take the place of an axe though. So if you're wondering in like a survival kit, what would I recommend? I would recommend something the size of our Onyoic and to take an axe along, and the axe that I would recommend is the Granford Brooks um, uh, Scandinavian axe. Those two things would, uh, would cover all of your needs. Um, let's see. Knives, knives, knives. Any other questions on knives? Say hi to Cody. Say hi to Cody. Cody, are you out there? Now that's a knife, Crocodile Dundee, yes it is. Uh, 
Like I said, we wanted to have a big knife for, for people that wanted to carry something, what I call the lower 48. Um, but, but when I go on my North Main winter trip, I do carry that Anyoic knife and then the uh, Grantsford Brux. Uh, people say, well, do you want, do you need to carry an ax? Uh, my answer, again, my opinion is yes, because with a knife, or even my bigger knife, you know, you can carve bow drills, you can carve traps, you can skin animals, you can't cut down a tree. If I just carried my ax, I can make a bow drill with the ax. Not comfortably, but I can make one. I can carve a, a trap. I could even skin a deer, and I can cut down a tree. Big difference between an axe and a hatchet, great question. First of all, hatchets are extremely dangerous. More people get hurt with hatchets than with axes by far. Reason is, people don't respect hatchets. People take a hatchet and they'll swing them one-handed and you don't respect them because they're a hatchet. Well, what happens is those hatchets will glance off and they'll end up in your leg. And if they're sharp, they'll go all the way to the bone just like an axe would. Um, a hatchet, you can't get enough power to really do significant work. Yeah, they'll split wood. Yeah, they'll, they'll make kindling. Yeah, they'll limb, take small branches off trees. Um, so will my bigger knife. Uh, like I said, I always use our North Main winter trip as an example. When you need to build a shelter, or better yet, you need to get firewood, you need to get serious firewood. A hatchet's not going to do it. You're going to need to take that axe, get up there, use your whole body, and start chopping down trees. You're not going to do that with a hatchet. Uh, hatchets are small, small handled, lightweight head. An axe usually has a 24 inch handle on it. You've got a two and a half, three pound head on it, and you're using your whole body to use it. That's the difference. Uh, I strongly recommend against hatchets. Uh, when you're talking axes, if any of you out there, uh, Grantsford Brooks, I should say, are very expensive. Uh, they're worth every penny. They're extremely sharp. There's two types. One is called a small forest axe. It's got a shorter blade. They fit real nice in your backpack. And there's the uh, Scandinavian axe, a little longer handle. They really have to be carried outside your pack. I would strongly recommend the larger axe. Uh, types of areas where there's a lot of vines, uh, South America, machetes are the way to go. Florida, yes, even in the Carolinas, machetes are the way to go. I haven't spent that much time there. I'm usually in the woodlands. I'm usually up in Canada, usually up, again, Maine, Michigan, New York, where we have hardwoods. So that's why with wood, axe. Uh, the only thing when I look at a machete, I, more than mine, they, uh, a lot of the machetes, and I should say kukris too, they have that, they come to that small angle there. I just, something in my gut says, that's the weak point. Now, uh, I did see in my time three break, so that sticks in my mind, but I'm sure it's about the manufacturer and, uh, and that, but uh, uh, I'm not an expert on machetes, so... Uh, I, I, there's more people with a lot more experience on that, but if you like machetes and they work for you, by all means, go for it. Recommendations for good axe for a smaller framed woman. Smaller framed woman, then I would probably, in your instance, say the Gransford Brooks small forest axe in your situation because... Uh, if you're under 5'5", five, five, Probably that's the X for you. Maybe even 5'6", five, six, under 5'6". Five, um, because th that bigger X just might be too big, too long to handle. So I'm glad you brought that up. Maybe in the future I'm going to put that stipulation on it. It depends how tall you are and, and how big your frame is. So thank you for that question. You just changed how I'm going to uh, make my X recommendations in the future. Like I said, the Grand First Brooks, they are expensive axes. But it's an axe you can bet your life on. All the North Main Master Guides, that is the axe they carry. By the way, the way they make those Grandsford Brux, if you do go on my website um, and go to the Brux, they, uh, somebody went out to Sweden where they make the axes, and they, the makers that make your axe 
puts the maker's mark in there. And they, he took some videos of the equipment they use. And the equipment they use is 120 years old. And you can see them using the pounding forges and stuff. And uh, they make them like they did 120 years ago. And they only make so many. And that's what they make. And they put their mark in them. And it's the old-fashioned way. Kind of like it. And by the way, you can use the uh, bluing on your Grand Fruit Brooks axe. By the way, speaking of axes, one thing you might want to do if you do get an axe, go to uh, Dick's Sporting Goods or a sporting goods store, get some hockey tape or uh, a baseball bat tape, and wrap the handle in it. That'll give you a little better grip on it. So when you're swinging it, you have a, a tighter grip. Then, right under the axe head, uh, you might want to wrap it with something. Um, we all miss <laughs> when you're swinging it and you know you're going to miss whatever you're trying to chop and if you miss a couple times you're going to start nicking the 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 x uh, handle which is going to be a weak spot so to protect it a little more wrap it with 550 cord maybe even wrap it down and back again so when you miss it's going to hit the 550 cord and not hurt your x handle and on top of that if you take your axe with you in the woods, you always have some extra 550 cord in an emergency. So it serves two purposes. Any other questions? You don't have to be taller. It's a, I have on safe I do all your work on my on your knees. Uh, that's just a sign that you're a very smart woman. Um, that's Nathan. Nathan? Nathan, you're a smart guy. <laughs> uh, on all of our main winter trips, if someone comes out, uh, I have them do all the chopping on their knees. And it's not a macho thing, it's not an ego thing, it's I just don't want to have to pull somebody out on a toboggan with an axe head that got stopped by their thigh bone. Okay, 550 cord is also called paracord um, or parachute cord. Fi uh, and see if she can find some 550 cord. I'll explain it and we can see if we can grab some. Um, it's cord that, uh, it's nylon cord that the military uses. It, ha it has 550 pounds of breaking strength, which is good to have with you. But now it has seven strands of cord on the inside that make it up. So, uh, if you have 10 feet of this 550 cord in your survival kit or, or whatever, you, because you always need cordage to, to make shelters, whatever, uh, chances are you're never going to need 550 pounds of breaking strength to, to do anything in the woods. Uh, so if you need more cordage than your 10 foot you brought along, you can take out the inner strands and take out all seven strands, and now... You have your seven strands, which happen to be 60 pounds of strength, plus the outer, outer sheath, and you can tie it together. Okay, so here's 550 cord. It comes in all kinds of colors. This happens to be the OD green. And switch blades are very sharp. You cut it. And here are the seven strands that are on the inside. So you tie these together and you have all of that cordage. So what I do with this, you can never have enough cordage. So uh, the 550 is tough cordage. Uh, it's great for your bow drill strings if you're making the bow drill to make uh, friction fires. Uh, I like this to you to replace my shoelaces. So if on your hiking boots you get a length of this 550 cord take out your shoelaces and put this as your shoelaces. It's nylon, so it's slipperier, so you're gonna to have to uh, double knot your shoelaces or tie the two bunny ears together twice so it doesn't slip out. But then whenever you go on a hike, whenever you take those boots, you always have two lengths of 550 cord in case you need cordage. So it's always a way to uh, ensure you have this 550 cord with you. So it's just good cordage to have with you rather than just shoelaces or, or normal cordage. People always ask how much cord they should have with them. Uh, if you ever come to my classes, this will give you a heads up because uh, if the first person says they want to take 30 feet, I'll say 30 feet is good, but 50 is better. 
So the next person naturally is going to get the answer right. They say 50 feet. I say, yeah, 50 feet's good. 75 is better. You know, go around the circle. Uh, the point to that is you can never have enough cord. So 50 feet is probably a minimum in your survival kit. Um, I carry 100. Uh, 100 is good. 150 would be better. So uh, as much as you can carry reasonably and, and not be crazy about it. But uh, yeah, 550 is good. They also have 550 cord now uh, with a strand of a waxed cord in there for a fire starter. So you take it out. They have still the seven strands, but they have one red strand that has, is a wax line. So if you pull it all out, that'll act like a wick, start a fire. And then you can get some cord now. They have not only the seven strands, they have the red waxed cord, but they also have a piece of snare wire in there and a piece of fishing line in there, of nylon fishing line. So naturally the price is going up as we're going this, but you can all get that all uh, for, for survival kits. So we'd like to know what your favorite, most durable multi-tool or EDC tool is. Cody, glad you joined in. Um, multi-tools... Uh, the two main ones that everyone seems to gravitate to are either Gerber or Leatherman. And from all the people I've talked to over the last 23 years, it seems whatever multi-tool that someone gave you or you purchased first is the one you like. Uh, I happened to get a, get a Leatherman when I first started. I like the Leatherman um, the best. But that doesn't mean the Gerbers or there's others out there. Um, I do, in the, in the Leatherman line, I do like the Leatherman Wave. Uh, two reasons for that. One, it, it has locking blades, and uh, that's a must. And secondly, the saw on the Leatherman Wave is awesome. Uh, the Leatherman line has a lot of different types of them. I know they have the Leatherman Juice, the real small ones. Um, I never purchased one yet because I don't have confidence in something that I don't think it's going to be durable enough. Um, for If I start cranking on it, that in a, like I said, if I'm in the North Main Woods and my life depends on something, it's cold, it's 15, 20 below zero, the tool's cold, and I'm cranking on it, that that thing's going to hold together. Never tried it, never had one in my hand, but it just doesn't seem like it's going to, it's going to work. Uh, I guess I should buy one and try it before I should say anything. That brings me up to another point about locking. Uh, if you ever buy a uh, folding knife, or you get a folding knife, and you open it, and you open it, listen, hear that click? That means the blade locks. This is good. <laughs> uh, if you happen to, and all, uh, most all, knives today have locking blades. If you happen to get a knife that your great-grandfather gave you or got passed down and you open it and there's not that click and the blade does not lock, which means the blade will close right away without you having to push on something, um, that's an accident waiting to happen. That means sometime when you're using that knife and you're going to be pushing on it, that blade is going to close down and come down on your finger like that. Don't worry, it won't cut your finger off or anything. It usually stops when the blade hits your bone. So, uh, if you have a knife that does not have a locking blade, either one or two things should happen. One, if it was your great-grandfather's, well, that's an heirloom. So I think you should put it in a very honorable place in your house, behind glass, and have a little plaque made up saying this was grandfather's, and honor it that way. If it's a knife that came from Walmart, throw it away. It's not worth keeping. Anything else? We're getting close to the hour, and I think we should, uh, if there's no other burning questions, probably wrap up. Um, a couple things. Uh, our edible medicinal plant class is coming up if you're close by. Uh, that's going to be on May 23rd. We're having a weekend survival class at the end of the month. They're all going. We're also having our full week survival class uh, June 14th through 21st, and that's a go. Uh, 
there's, uh, we're part of the uh, critical uh, businesses going on. What's more critical than in a crisis than a uh, survival training and uh, self-reliance classes? So we're having those. Also offering uh, a uh, free whistle for anyone that uh, buys anything from Midwest Native Skills uh, store from now until midnight on Sunday. So just make a purchase. We have 112 decibel little orange whistles. A whistle is a critical item in a survival kit. Uh, a lot of people think, well, that's just something that, you know, kids carry. It's not. A whistle can be heard five times further than the human voice. Uh, in your survival kit, you should have several. One in your kit, one on your person, one someplace else that you can easily get to. It should be at least 100 decibels. And uh, because you could be hurt, and after yelling for three, four, five hours, uh, somebody could be within a couple hundred feet of you. And after you're yelling, you might not have any voice left, but you might have enough wind to blow a whistle. And uh, I'm not sure if you realize it, but there's uh, three blasts on a whistle three times in a row is an international distress signal. And that goes in your car. If your car is off the road, three toots of your horn three times in a row is that international distress signal. So having a whistle, having your uh, significant other have a whistle on their person, in their coats, could save their life. So we're going to give one whistle for every uh, order, and uh, that goes from now until uh, uh, Sunday at midnight. Any other questions, Cheryl? Got a couple of people who want to try to make your survival class. Well, that would be nice. We would love to have you. And uh, we're good. the classes are small. We're going to definitely keep them under 15. And uh, our classes, uh, all meals included. And uh, no, you don't have to eat bugs unless you really want to, and we'll just tell you how to eat those. What's better, the summer or fall class? Uh... I like the summer class, well, I like the summer class because we have more daylight hours. We actually kind of cover more. I like the fall class because we can have things like uh, the stews and grilled cheese and tomato soup more, and it's more fun to get closer <coughs> to, to the fire in the fall. But there's more daylight hours and we cover more in the summer class. What do you cover? What do we cover? Uh, we don't have enough time to talk. To, no, uh, we cover the basics: uh, fire, shelter, water, food. Naturally, we go into navigation. Uh, in the summer class, I can go into edible medicinal plants. We'll do actually make some first aid salves and actually do things with the plants. Um, we'll go into nighttime navigation. We'll go over navigation with a compass. We'll go over navigation without a compass. Uh, like I said, we'll do the flint and steel. We'll do rubbing sticks together to make fires. We'll go um, traps, trapping, game trails. Uh, I always uh, have people write me before the class if there's something in specific you want to cover. We go over that. We go over knives, a little bit what we covered now, but we also go into knife sharpening. Uh, we go over signaling. We go over campfire cooking. Our... Uh, Evening campfires is open discussion. We try to leave politics out uh, and religion, but other than that, it's open discussion on whatever you want to talk about. At the classes, uh, we have uh, no dogs, no drugs, no firearms, uh, but other than that, we have a good time, and uh, we cover anything you want to know about survival, basically. Ages? Ages. Uh, we, I had... It, Anybody under 18 needs a parent with them. I did have uh, several uh, parents come with, with kids. Eight seems to be about the minimum age for carving skills only. I did have parents bring kids that were seven. Uh, they needed some help with carving. Uh, usually, though, the average age for the people coming to our classes is 40, uh, 40 to 45. Uh, 40% typically are women that come to our classes, 60% uh, are men. Uh, I have couples coming. I have uh, husband and wives, boyfriend, girlfriend. Uh, I've had people from Ireland come to our classes. They flew in here. Um, I've had uh, grandparents come. 
just for the simple reason they wanted to learn the skills so they could uh, go home and teach their grandkids. So it's all kind of reasons. Uh, we do have discounts available, uh, you know, bring members of the family and bring friends and stuff. So there are discounts available. We're trying to keep the cost down because that's everybody's concern now. And we certainly understand that. So it's on the website. Most questions are answered, but if not, give us a call. You'll get me on the phone. I'll be happy to answer any questions. We have a toll free number. It's 888-886-5592. And uh, you guys know the website of survivalschool.com. Thanks for joining in. Please send me an email. Uh, what would you like to hear next Thursday or the following Thursday that uh, we can uh, share on, on, on these little chats? Tom at survivalschool.com is the email address or give me a call, whatever. But what would you like uh, to hear on the next, uh, next uh, Facebook Live? Thanks for joining us. Hope to see you again.